I was given the really difficult task to talk about a very odd species, the Homo austriacus. Uh, and uh, let me start with some famous last words of an Austrian politician. Uh, Fred Sinovac, a socialist, it's all very complicated. And I think the first defining characteristic of an Austrian is, uh, you could say, complexity, but usually it's just uh, too much complication. Uh, so um, let me see what's, what's an Austrian, what's Austria. Not even that is quite certain. Uh, it's uh, maybe a Latinized version of a Germanic uh, word for the East. Uh, so usually it's referred to Osterrichi, the Eastern March or Margraviate, a borderland and the border region, a small territory, about a thousand hectares. Uh, but uh, for some Swiss upstarts, it became their power base uh, due to a forged document. Uh, and uh, those Swiss upstarts, of course, are the Habsburgs, and they created one of the largest, most important empires in. Europe, so Austria is much more important than it seems uh, nowadays, in particular for uh, European culture as always being in the borderland region. And I tried to figure out what are the defining characteristics of this Austrian. And then, of course, I tried to deduce something about Austrian economics uh, and what's so Austrian, what may be Austrian about Austrian economics. Uh, now, uh, the first thing that one realizes when visiting uh, Austria, of course, it's that now it's an alpine state, you know, beautiful mountains. And uh, I've talked many years ago about the traditional liberty of mountain peoples and mountain cultures. Uh, and I think some of that implies still, in particular, to the countryside uh, of Austria. But there is a difference. Uh, uh, even those mountain Austrians are not just uh, uh, a recluded uh, mountain population defending their old traditions, but they've historically always been at the center and uh, even at the center of trade routes. So I think it's a very interesting mix anthropologi anthropologically between this kind of mountaineering uh, culture and a culture of trade which goes back uh, quite a long time. It's a long tradition of metal production and of international trade. Uh, the Danube is one of the very few rivers which flows to the east, uh, uh, or the main rivers which flows to the east uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, through the mountain passes already since Roman times, uh, we had a lot of trade and the Celts already were big in metal production. Uh, so there is a long tradition of kind of merchant entrepreneurship uh, within these mountains. Uh, we have the tradition of the hammer lords, so-called hammer lords, which are basically entrepreneurs running big uh, uh, production facilities which have been powered by water mainly. So there's an interesting kind of industrialization long before the steam engine uh, going on in parts of Austria uh, in minting and metal production, uh, which I, I think gives, gives it a, a particular kind uh, of mindset. Uh, uh, I've traveled those alpine regions a lot. I've written a book uh, about them, and uh, uh, that's really one of the aspects I like a lot uh, about uh, uh, modern Austria is, uh, I have the impression that there's a certain mentality surviving, kind of realism, honesty, directness, uh, and a no-nonsense attitude, uh, which I find usually in stark contrast uh, to the more urban uh, settlers uh, of modern Austria uh, and nowadays. Uh, most Austrians ethnically seem to be Bavarianized Slavs, uh, so the Bavarians, of course, southern Germans, uh, so we're in a way Germanized, uh, and this uh, uh, Macha Orientalis or Macha Austria was kind of eastern from the Bavarians, of course, to the east, uh, eastern borderland uh, region. And uh, there's even a hypothesis that Austria might go back to a Slavic term, which is Ostragora, a steep mountain. So that refers already to the mountains, even though the region uh, of Ostarichi is not very mountainous, but you can still see <laughs> the mountains in the distance, uh, maybe. Uh, and I, I think this kind of intersection between trade, production, and mountain cultures produced a kind of anti-collectivist mindset of this. Some residues still survives in the mountain regions. Uh, 
and it's uh, anti-collectivist in the sense that it doesn't really, as the flat plains uh, uh, of the state, it doesn't lend itself easily to organization. Uh, you have all these recluded val valleys with the different dialects uh, and so on. Uh, and I think it's still a stark contrast in particular to the flatlands uh, up to the north uh, in Germany and Prussia in particular. Uh, the survival in the Alpine region still needs cooperation, so there is a strong tradition of non-state cooperation uh, still surviving until today with a lot of cooperatives. You have water cooperatives, you have valley cooperatives, and those are overlapping, so they are not just exclusive nation-like, uh, state-like uh, creatures, but more kind of bottom-up cooperation between smaller scale farmers uh, who basically are entrepreneurs, of course. Uh, we have a tradition of uh, uh, dispersed farms uh, in large parts uh, of Austria. Uh, so I think that's one part of it, but of course I think that's the nicest, maybe <laughs> the most unique part. Uh, uh, then of course for political and religious reasons, uh, Austria has been severed from the German uh, in particular German political units uh, for a while. And uh, one of the religious reasons, of course, uh, Catholicism, that the Counter-Reformation was successful uh, in Austria because the Habsburg were a uh, Catholic uh, uh, family. And uh, it's a kind of top-down uh, imposition, of course, uh, but still uh, large parts retain the Catholic culture and uh, what's a Catholic about the culture and what makes it unique? I think it's the Baroque style. And uh, Baroque uh, meant in the beginning something strange and bizarre. Even the word grotesque comes from the grotto in the Baroque garden. Uh, so what's so strange and bizarre about the Baroque culture? Uh, I think it's in stark contrast to the uh, Puritan classicism, which once have orderly forms, and the Baroque culture is more dedicated to the dynamic forms of life and death. So you have stark dynamic contrasts, and I think it has affected a bit the mindset. Uh, the, the human form is considered as divine in uh, Catholic thought, uh, so you see a lot more reference to the human body, to the human form, and to the sensual uh, as opposed to the more abstract, idealized uh, um, uh, approach uh, to art. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you have the universality of Catholicism and the interconnectedness, so it was the Baroque uh, culture uh, combined many different art forms, uh, in particular opera, music, and, and uh, sculpture, and paintings. Uh, and uh, I think that's contributed to a unique mentality which uh, until nowadays is a bit different from the German. German. Um, and then there might even be a link to the Austrian school. Some philosophers claim, as the philosopher Mr. Krassel uh, has tried to point out, that as Aristotelian, Aristotelian realism has survived due to Catholicism to a larger degree in Austria throughout the schools and the universities. And uh, interestingly, one of the few philosophers Karl Menger cites frequently is Aristotle uh, in um, uh, his principles. Uh, so there might even be a link to that realism in a philosophical philosophical sense, uh, which I like to see as defining, uh, in particular in an age where reality isn't, doesn't seem to be that important, uh, and understanding of reality doesn't seem to be that important compared to your idealized utopian visions of what should be and what could be. Uh, so then, of course, it seems like Austria is German, but not Germany. And I think that's one of the best points uh, about it, to be German, but uh, not Germany. Um, uh, and it meant usually to not be Prussian. So Austrian could be defined as the not or non-Prussian. Uh, and that was the view of one of the most important poets and writers uh, of uh, Austrian literature, Hugo von Hofmannsthal. And he even set up a table. He started comparing the typical Austrian and the typical Prussian. Uh, and I think it's quite uh, insightful. Of course, uh, the only way to speak about the Austrian uh, is in an Austrian way, which means with a disclaimer that you shouldn't take anything too serious of what I'm saying. Uh, that, that is uh, quite important. <laughs> I think it's all full of prejudice, but of course, contrary to popular prejudice, uh, calling something a prejudice doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, but still, it's a list of prejudices uh, that Hugo von Hofmannsthal von Hoffmannsthal offered in a table. He 
uh, contrast it by saying the Prussians are bond together by a state mentality, whereas the Austrians are bond together by love for the homeland. Uh, now, what does that mean? Um, I figured out the love for the homeland in the Alpine region is something completely different. It does not refer usually to a closed border uh, that you control or a closed bordered region that you try to control. Usually, uh, if in the Alpine countryside people refer to their Heimat, their homeland, they are referring to mountaintops, to pinnacles as points of orientation. Uh, so it's a kind of attachment uh, to the place you've grown up uh, or you feel a longing uh, to, uh, and uh, that's a quite a different bond, uh, I'd say. Uh, Hugo von Hofmannsthal claimed that the Prussians show more virtue and more efficiency, seems obvious, but the Austrians more piety and more humanity. Uh, thus Prussians are strong in abstractions and great in execution, the Austrians are quicker in perception. Uh, the Prussian acts by the book and the Austrian acts according to decency. Of course, that's a very positive <laughs> look on, on the, uh, the Austrian side. Uh, the Prussian is more consistent uh, but may show cowardice, in particular when being part of a group. A cowardice in standing out, uh, uh, being afraid to stand out, whereas the Austrian shows more ability to find one's way in life individually. The Prussian shows more self-confidence, whereas the Austrian shows more self-irony. Uh, and uh, whereas the Prussian tends to hard exaggeration, the Austrian tends towards irony until self-dissolution. So it might even be uh, looked at as a point of characterlessness or lack of character, uh, whereas uh, the Prussian has a willed character according to Hofmannsthal and the inability to think oneself into others. Uh, he tends to be self-righteous, presumptuous, schoolmasterly, whereas the Austrian tends to be shamefaced, vain, and witty. Uh, of course, as I said, full of prejudice, uh, uh, but uh, I think maybe a bit enlightening. Uh, the German says Hofmannsthal is accustomed from his school days onwards to show disdain for healthy human understanding by being satisfied with words that have been raised up to the noble standing of concepts. Uh, uh, and of course, we had this impression of idealist abstract philosophy on Germany, uh, which uh, Austria has not been spared, but a little bit. Uh, 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 only a little bit. Uh, then, of course, Austria compared to Prussia was an old empire uh, and not a progressive nation state. Uh, and that tended to be the most important political uh, difference. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the link between culture and democracy is just as Hans has stated in his introduction to the democracy that got that failed, he gives the Austrian Empire as an example. Uh, and I think I have a reason for that, of course, negative correlation between culture and democracy. So as an old empire, of course, it was always lacking uh, in democracy, uh, whatever that means. Uh, and I think the reason is that culture is produced by an elite of geeks. And in a democratic state, this elite of geeks uh, is to a large part absorbed by politics. So you have all these policy wongs, uh, which would concentrate on the more aesthetic, scientific, cultural endeavors to prove themselves, to become upstarts. Uh, and of course, the reason for this aesthetic passions of the Austrian bourgeoisie was to imitate uh, the noblemen, uh, uh, but they couldn't imitate them polit politically, so they had to imitate them as patrons of culture and science. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons for the flourishing of uh, culture in Austria. Uh, uh, so not being progressive was actually quite a strong point in having a quite progressive and flourishing uh, culture, uh, which still defines Austria and still, I mean, the main capital surviving, which we've been living off quite comfortably for a long time, is this huge culture capital that's been amassed uh, over uh, quite a long time. Uh, uh, in uh, Austria, of course, there were 
reforms and uh, or even democratic reforms, uh, but it tended to be a top-down thing with a small state elite, uh, which is usually referred to as Josephinism, and uh, Karl Peter will talk about more uh, uh, later on. Uh, and this kind of Josephinism, which goes to back to uh, the en e enlightened absolutism uh, of uh, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, is... Uh, of course, I think it's the stain on the liberal elites uh, of Austria. So uh, most uh, thought uh, about liberalization as being a top-down process which needs to get rid of the old traditions and cultures which are an obstacle to being a progressive state. Uh, but in Austria, it was just a small elite uh, and I think it uh, failed uh, in a tremendous way and it was obvious in Austria. The failure was obvious. When the liberals were successful, they disappeared. Uh, they, uh, I, uh, there are a few pla places where it's that obvious uh, that the kind of Whigism or liberal Whigism uh, was a big failure in Austria. And I think that reflected upon the political mentality of Austrians, a kind of skepticism, uh, a kind uh, of pessimism even. Um, I'll um, talk more about that uh, later on. So being an old empire, interestingly, even though it was a borderland against the Avars and the Huns and the Turks uh, and the Mongols uh, and so on, later on the Ottoman Empire turned out to be an ally uh, because it was one of the remaining old empires and both the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian Empire nationalism was the major danger of foe, in particular the new language oriented uh, uh, and exclusive nationalism that was emerging uh, linked to democracy uh, later on. Uh, so it was more like the Ottoman Empire than Prussia, of course, uh, and uh, uh, early on there was a kind of direction towards the east, uh, given the Danube, the old trade links, uh, and for a certain time Austria was really important in oriental trade. Uh, uh, most of the mail was done by Austrian ships in the Ottoman Empire and uh, Austrian harbors became centers of cotton uh, trade. Uh, and that was the main reason why a new kind of entrepreneurship emerged in Austria. It was mainly in the textile industry uh, which created private riches. Uh, and uh, uh, I think then with having this orientation in trying to be patrons of the arts and cultures is the main reason for this flourishing. And I would call it a kind of late enlightenment uh, in Austria. Uh, but of course, we'll have to distinguish enlightenment. Uh, uh, I think the if one can talk about an Austrian Enlightenment, it's much, clo much closer to the Scottish Enlightenment than to the French Enlightenment. Uh, and uh, I think the main difference is uh, that you really have that exchange between the academics and the artists and the merchants. Uh, and uh, then I think we can see uh, in Vienna, out of all places, in the private atmosphere of the salon or the coffee shop, uh, uh, it's a more private exchange of people from different walks of life. It's not an exclusive academic or exclusively political project, uh, this kind of enlightenment. So it's really a flourishing of merchants who have the money and the time to be interested in scholarship and scholars and artists who are uh, funded by and helped by these patrons uh, of arts and the sciences. And I, I think that's a unique mix. Uh, so I'm quite fond of this description as late enlightenment. And I totally agree with my Swiss friend, Robert Neff, who counts the Austrian school among those uh, representatives of the late Austrian enlightenment. Uh, uh, the orientation to the East, uh, is also reflected in the saying by Metternich that in Vienna the Balkans begin and uh, uh, Vienna of course is quite odd, it's not Alpine uh, in any sense, it's a contrast, it's uh, even in its music you feel that there's an Eastern touch, it's more uh, 
uh, it has a more sentimental feeling to it, uh, uh, and it sounds a bit like crying. Uh, it's not uh, that happy alpine fol folkloric music. Uh, so I think in Austria there was really a meeting of different souls, uh, and uh, it's a historic bridge between, so it's maybe the easternmost part of Western Europe, I'd say, uh, with crucial importance to, to uh, Europe as a, uh, as a cultural area. And uh, then, of course, uh, Vienna became a center. In Vienna, early on, even Maria Theresia started a school. Uh, which is now a diplomatic academy and started as a school to learn Turkish, uh, interestingly, uh, Turkish, Persian, and Arabic uh, for reasons of trade. Uh, and of course, it was mercantilism uh, that, that's a tainted uh, aspect of Austrian entrepreneurship. Uh, as Josephinism in economics as well, we had a top down approach uh, of a small era of almost complete economic liberty but reserved to a small minority. And they were called the K and K privilegierte Großhändler, the privileged great merchants. And it was really just a small number of people who got amazing economic liberty. No taxation, no regulation, entirely free to do as you like, be based in free harbors like Trieste and Fiume, um, uh, well, yeah, you're totally exempt <laughs> from any state oversight, more or less. Uh, and of course, that led to an increase of riches uh, and a belated but very quick industrialization of Austria, but it led to reactions as well, and they were very stark in Vienna. So you had this kind of late enlightenment, lots of people having time and passion to think about the world, and you have a tiny elite controlling a lot of this economic process. And then, of course, you have the typical pattern of inflation. Uh, the founders era in the 19th century, the, the phase of the strongest economic development ended in the founders' crash. And it's a typical boom-bust cycle early on, quite a classical example of that. Uh, and the reaction was very strong. So in Vienna, you had all kind of lunatic reactions uh, against uh, uh, the market economy, against capitalism. And for a while in the Vienna coffee shop, you could go there and you could meet a young Stalin, a Trotsky, a Hitler, uh, uh, sitting there and thinking their schemes. Of course, everyone was ignoring them and it wasn't uh, obvious uh, what they were up to. Uh, but it all started in Vienna, unfortunately, so uh, I think it's quite apt to describe this small Austria as uh, Karl Kraus has done as a kind of laboratory for global lunacy. Yeah, that's the way he termed it, and I think that was very prophetic uh, uh, at the time, and that shows, of course, the importance of Austria. Uh, another uh, famous saying is, it's the kleine Welt, in der die große ihre Probe hält, it's the small world in which the greater world holds its rehearsal, uh, of course, a rehearsal for lunacy, the lunacy of the 20th century. Um, but that, of course, means that Vienna was the best place to study the lunacy in its beginning. Uh, so that's why Vienna produced this profound tradition of understanding lunacy, criticizing lunacy, and trying to fight lunacy. But of course, when trying to fight lunacy, you realize, you realize that you need a certain mindset and that was developed in Vienna and uh, now I, I started about talking about the homo, now I'm talking about the gay, uh, it's the gay apocalypse uh, in Vienna, it's the certain mood where you understand that processes of decivilization are going on. And you as an individual, of course, you are part of historical patterns, uh, it would be quite foolish to uh, exaggerate uh, your importance and to take it too hard uh, that uh, sometimes the world doesn't seem to follow the Whiggish pattern, uh, but a pattern of frustration and of things being built up, falling down. Uh, so it's a particular mindset, uh, uh, which is a bit gloomy, but still uh, full of irony and humor, and I think it's the only way to take it, and I think it's the only way to take the modern world. Uh, and did, this art was perfected uh, in Vienna, uh, how to live through times of decivilization, and how to keep your good spirits uh, at a time like that. Uh, uh, in the Fledermaus, there's a famous line, the operetta, glücklich ist, wer vergisst, was doch nicht zu ändern ist. Uh, you are happy if you start, stop thinking about what you can change, uh, just 
I mean, you can conclude, focus on what you can change, that would be quite positive, uh, uh, but of course you can also just conclude a very pessimistic outlook as uh, it's obvious in Nestroy, another very important uh, uh, writer uh, for Austria, uh, he says, for example, uh, of every human, I believe the worst, including myself, and I've hardly ever been wrong. Uh, so it's a kind of gloomy, but maybe realistic, no-nonsense approach to human nature. You don't expect too much. You've seen the utopian ideas and experiments. You've seen the lunacy in its infancy. And uh, if you're an intelligent person, you've learned something. Uh, and uh, Nestroy again, he says, I think, uh, the major characteristic of progress is it always seems larger than it really is. Uh, and it's kind of no-nonsense approach, I'd say, uh, which I really like in Austrian literature, uh, and in particular in this phase I would call the late Enlightenment. Uh, so I think quite obviously it was the right setting for the Austrian School of Economics to emerge, and there are some parts that are really, really Austrian uh, in that sense. Uh, uh, among it. Uh, now let's look at modern Austria just briefly. Uh, I have a hate and love relationship, of course, with the country. Um, Eric Greta von Kühne Lidin has uh, described this the Republik der Neidgenossen. Uh, so it's a republic. Uh, of which the last remaining bond is envy. Uh, it's not like the Eidgenossen in Switzerland, uh, it's the Neidgenossen in Austria, which means comrades in envy. Uh, and uh, of course, maybe it's linked to having been great in the past and being reduced to being quite small uh, and stuff like that. I mean, of course, that should do something to our cultural mentality. Uh, uh, so, um, the typical Austrian today is a bureaucrat and a beneficiary of free distribution, of course, and he thinks it's all uh, just, uh, and uh, it's an amazing miracle that has happened in Austria due to socialism. Uh, Vienna is still listed uh, among uh, quite a few rankings as the best place in the world to live, the highest quality of life, so it looks like an amazing success story that we have. Uh, uh, of course, there are other reasons than social socialism for that, uh, uh, but they are quite complicated uh, to look at. Those rankings are mainly done by asking expats. So if you are living on the UN salary tax-free in Vienna, it's great, uh, in particular because the competition by Viennese spenders is reduced because they are taxed so highly that you can get a lot for your money. Uh, and then, of course, you live in a city that was among the five top cities in the world already in the last uh, and, uh, century and the century before. Uh, so it already had two million inhabitants and you see that, of course, in the city is a, has a huge cultural heritage and architecture and buildings even outside of the small city centers where most tourists are concentrated. So you have a lot of high quality buildings uh, uh, already built for two million people city, this rich culture and this rich cultural heritage uh, and uh, most of the value nowadays is created by tourism. So that's of course a bit concentrated and transitory. So if you don't have to earn your money in Vienna uh, or you don't have to earn it honestly in Vienna, it's a great place to live uh, uh, certainly, but then also you can have a great life in France of course if you don't depend on the France salary and are not taxed by the friends. Hey, French is a bit like that I'd say. Uh, the, quality of life uh, in Austria. Uh, it's still, I mean, what's positive uh, about uh, uh, Austria, of course we had the German Wirtschaftswunder as well, but kind of piggyback, so uh, even in Germany they don't understand anything about their uh, economic miracle, and in Austria it's even less understanding, so most Austrians are pretty sure it's redistribution that made us that wealthy uh, and will keep us that wealthy. Uh, but I'd say 90% of the population are convinced uh, this kind of uh, uh, yeah, redistributive system uh, and the proposed system we had in Austria that had so brought about the social peace and harmony where everyone gets along and uh, we all get wealthy mysteriously. Uh, and uh, of course, there was a lot of historical luck being the major trade partner of, of Germany and being on the right side of the Iron Curtain. Uh, just historical luck, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> uh, 
because it was quite close, it was fairly close. Uh, and if Mises is correct in his uh, uh, memories, uh, he was quite crucial in avoiding Soviet and socialist experiments uh, in Austria by convincing the socialists of the time who were real thinkers at the time, of course, in Vienna. Uh, and so he had, he made some impression apparently just by argumentation uh, on them in the coffee shops and in the salons, uh, uh, which I think is great. So. Uh, what is positive about Austria nowadays? I think the best thing about it is relatively small. Uh, not as small as it should be or could be, but still relatively small compared to other countries. As I said, it's part of German culture, but it's not Germany, and I think nowadays that's really a big plus. Uh, uh, and it's less urban than Germany, so you still have these uh, countervailing powers of the countryside, uh, this alpine culture I mentioned before. So I think that's, that's one of the reasons I'm still living in Austria and I, I enjoy living in Austria. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the tendency is obvious, but we always say in Austria we were five years later than the Germans, so we can always watch uh, uh, in consternation what the Germans are doing and then have enough time, we hope, to <laughs> uh, uh, react or flee, um, as it turns out. So, what is so Austrian about the Austrian school? Um, I'd say it's a realist approach, a no-nonsense approach to the world. It's interdisciplinary, which of course much of this spirit of the late enlightenment in Vienna, uh, where most of uh, the, pro the scientific progress happened not at university. That was quite obvious. It was not the major academics. Uh, most of the important representatives of Austrian schools, and there are various Austrian Viennese schools, uh, uh, never got full professorships. Uh, it was usually the more, I mean, mainstream colleagues. Uh, so a lot happened in the coffee shops and the salon atmosphere where there was also an exchange with the practitioners, the entrepreneurs, the merchants, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, I think that shows in the Austrian school as well. I think the Geistkreis of Hayek and, of course, the Miseskreis uh, were really the places where most uh, scientific progress happened uh, for a school and influenced a lot of different uh, disciplines uh, uh, which we may not even know because it's hidden. Uh, there are no transcripts of the sessions of the Mises Kreis, uh, uh, but it's hidden in the influence of very important thinkers uh, of their time. Uh, I think what's Austrian about the Austrian school as well is it respects complexity, diversity, and individuality, uh, which of course was the only way to survive in this complicated pattern of the K K and K monarchy, uh, a mix of ethnicities and religions, uh, in particular in Vienna, that showed this kind of complication. Uh, so it really doesn't lend itself to idealize political projects because you immediately you run into practical difficulties of how people settled historically and what their links are, and they're all very paradoxical. Uh, so the kind of ethnic cleansing that happened also, of course, happened uh, later with the wars uh, and uh, the the landscape before was totally different and extremely complicated, uh, uh, so you can't really draw lines on the map, uh, and it's most obvious, I think, in, in this region. Uh, I think there's uh, what's Austrian about the Austrian school is a distrust in the great ideals, uh, even the ideal of democracy. Uh, I think that it's not Whiggish in the sense that at least there is some experience. I mean, we still see some Whiggism, some hope in progress, which I don't think is bad at all, in Mises uh, and other representatives, but we also see in Mises over his life, of course, he becomes more gloomy. And the same thing happened with Menga. He became very gloomy. Uh, uh, he even stopped writing. Uh, uh, so I think that's too much. That's not the Viennese way uh, to uh, really take it to your heart. Uh, um, and so I, I think we see that there was um, realization that civilization is fragile and de-civilization is a constant uh, danger. So uh, a Dutch uh, historian, Mr. Decker, has described the uh, members of the Austrian schools as students of civilization. I would add uh, that they are also students of de-civilization and uh, that tends to be overlooked uh, uh, and maybe even be more important uh, uh, to look at this darker side of uh, 
human trends uh, with a no-nonsense no approach as well and not this idealized, politicized approach, but just no bullshit approach, trying to understand what's going on uh, without putting up your pink glasses uh, while doing so. And I think there's uh, quite a reason to see that that's typically Austrian or Viennese uh, about it and shaped by the time and the mentality um, at the place of the time. Uh, Nowadays, there is some uh, trend by academics to uh, claim that the modern Austrian school is not Austrian at all. It's an invention by Americans, and there is a lot of blame heaped nowadays. The, a few works have come out recently who study the history of the Austrian school by academics, mainstream academics, and they, of course, they point towards uh, something that happened in the US tradition, and uh, I think unfairly Hans gets a lot of blame as well uh, for being a representative of an un-Austrian Austrian school, and I think that's totally mistaken. And, uh, but I think the mistake is uh, an easy one to make, uh, and the mistake comes uh, from this tiny little phase at the end of the 19th century where the representatives of the Austrian school were also part of a liberal state elite. That was a very short time, but it was, it's conspicuous, of course, if you look at history, how many ministers the Austrian school produced uh, and what they did and how many excellencies they produced. So major representatives of the Austrian monarchy, so you'd say very established or part of the establishment and part of a liberal, Whiggish, progressive establishment with some Josephinist leanings of a top-down bureaucrats trying to impose liberty upon their unknowing and uh, uncultivated population. Uh, and I don't think that's the best part about the Austrian school. I think it's just a biographic accident. Uh, I don't think it's too bad neither. I mean, they had some influence, uh, uh, but I think it's overrated and overstated. And I think the most driving force behind this recent interpretation of what's Austrian about Austrian economics tend uh, to look at the status of a mainstream established liberal elite and conclude that the Austrian school in the United States is not part of the establishment, it's not part of the academic mainstream. So someone must have done something wrong, maybe by having too low standards, maybe by being exaggerated uh, uh, ideologues uh, and so on. Uh, and, uh, by sidelining the gatekeepers in media and academia and so on. So on the surface, it looks as if there's a story to tell, and I think it's a, uh, the totally wrong story uh, to tell. Uh, uh, my impression is if you really look, and of course you have to change with the context, and it's quite obvious when Mises moved uh, from the context of his old Vienna, he somehow he realized it's gone. That age is gone. And he reinvented himself, a new surrounding, a new era with new geopolitical challenges, with new ideological challenges, and he changed a bit his style, uh, which I think is obvious in, in human action uh, as compared to national economy. There's a little change in style, and there's a change in focus, and there's a change on uh, yeah, what you focus on, what you leave out, but I don't think it's a change in mindset. Uh, I'm pretty uh, uh, confident that Mises has remained true to himself uh, and has now somehow turned into a different person, but the context, of course, changes. I mean, we cannot just continue the discussions of the 19th century uh, in Vienna. The Austrian school, if it's a tradition, must be a living tradition. Uh, so in that sense, I'm quite sure that this property and freedom society is the most Austrian gathering in that sense that I know of, because it really, and that was the idea of Hans in the first place to have a salon. And what's a peculiar Austrian about the salon? It's really, it's not a public pretense that you have. It's a private gathering of like-minded people who have the absolute liberty to speak their mind and the absolute liberty to show a no-nonsense approach to the world without thinking about sensibilities and, uh, and all the political considerations of realpolitik and so on. And I think that's defining about the Austrian school and I think that's the main reason the Austrian school has survived, uh, that made it special, because it's not just a margin marginalist tradition that has become part of the mainstream, uh, as it's uh, usually told, but it's a real an approach of students of decivilization, maybe, or 
have it both ways uh, of the uh, trends uh, of their time. We are willing to understand them in an interdisciplinary and no-nonsense way. So I think in that sense, I can really close by saying thank you for your attention, my fellow Austrians. Thank you.